So we're coming towards the end of COP27. Who are the winners and who are the losers? I'll give you mine first. On the winning side, I think loss and damage is the big takeaway from this event. Um, it's on the agenda formally for the first time. There's a discussion going on that uh, is beginning to broach topics like should there be a permanent facility, should there be a mechanism for wealthy nations to consider how to pay, how to make reparation for the damage done historically by their carbon emissions. That's a big, that's a big win, I think, from, these from this conference. Um, I would say another winner here would be the fossil fuel industry. They're here in bigger numbers than before. Now, that's not to say they're necessarily here to subvert the process or block progress. Um, it's just the fact that they're here. Uh, and that's a function, I think, of the year that we've just had. I mean, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, the energy crisis in Europe, which has spread to the world, um, fossil fuels, particularly natural gas, I would say, are increasingly viewed as a short-term solution to our, you know, our, our energy crisis. And it's also been viewed historically as a transition fuel away from coal towards renewable energies through natural gas. So they've been a winner here too. What about you? What are you, what are you looking at? My winners, uh, I guess one, one, a first winner would be Brazil. Uh, I think that in many ways, uh, this cup felt like uh, the return of Brazil in climate talks. Yeah. Not just kind of like having a seat at the table, but also being a leader for kind of like a South-South collaboration. Yeah. Uh, we saw the, the official launch of the uh, rainforest uh, um, coalition between uh, Brazil, Indonesia, and uh, DRC, the Democratic Republic of Congo, yeah. the three biggest yeah. they're, the, they're, they're called the OPEC of carbon. The OPEC of carbon. That's, great. that's the. I like that. That's kind of like the the term that people have been using mm -hmm. around. So uh, we don't know yet what it's you know what's going to come out of it because right now it's really just a framework with no specific you yeah. know pledges or announcements or anything like that. The new Lula administration will take this forward, and there is a sense that the ambition will be much much higher. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Lula's presence here was really kind of like, uh, he received a warm welcome uh, and, and all of his uh, announcements and statements um, kind of like pointed to, again, not just a seat on the table, but a, but a, a leadership from Brazil uh, uh, across the emerging uh, market. So that's one. Yeah. Um, and then I guess on the flip side, I would say Australia is a loser. <laughs> you know, they've had um, their, election a few, their election a few months ago. People call it the climate election. Um, Prime Minister Albanese had made so many climate-related commitments. And he didn't come. And he did he not He wasn't come. here. He did not. I feel like he missed out on an opportunity yeah, to, yeah, yeah. to make his first big move on the international scene, and uh, especially since he wants to um, uh, host a cup. Yes, he that's true. That he wants to yep. host a cup alongside uh, Pacific <laughs> Islands. Right, I'll stop you there. Yeah. And I'm going to say that Australia was, in fact, a big winner at How this so? cup because they're serving the best coffee here. <laughs> you go to the Australian stand just behind this, this wall here and it is the best coffee at COP. But I don't drink coffee so that's oh, probably well. why I, they remain in my okay. in my loser category. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so yeah I would put Australia there um, and you you were telling me earlier actually that they had the when you were talking with some of the, that's right. um, folks of the Australia delegation. I mean, they came here with fairly modest ambitions which is surprising given uh, what you've just been saying. Um, you know, at, at, a, at a briefing uh, yesterday, in fact, they, they were congratulating themselves that the minister, the Australian minister, had been appointed to co-facilitate some discussions, some technical discussions that need resolution by, yeah. you know, by the end of the COP. Uh, and if that was the level of their ambition, if they were happy about just being picked to yeah. facilitate a discussion, their ambitions were fairly modest. South Africa is another winner. Um, featured very heavily in most of the uh, uh, African conversations and panels and side events that I've seen, that I've attended. I would say there's a back-to-back -back success in terms of their uh, Just Energy Transition Partnership. 8.5 billion announced last year. They got right. 500 million uh, this year when a lot of people were saying that this initiative was probably not going to, you know, uh, uh, see any follow-ups. And we talked about the Indonesian uh, Just about Energy Transition as well. They, yeah. they, 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 they're a winner this year, 20 billion to get off coal. So uh, again, same idea. Yes, yeah, same idea. So for South Africa, I think it's a big deal because I mean that they pioneered this. Um, so much so that, uh, you know, now we're seeing this shift from, you know, global deals to more uh, uh, kind of like a country specific deals. And, and it would be interesting to see what would be the impact for multilateralism, right? Yes, so yes. if we keep, if people keep coming to cups, no, not so much to, to strike global mm. deals where all of the 189, you yeah. know, uh, uh, delegations uh, uh, agree upon, but they just take this opportunity and platform to do bilateral deals. Mm. What's the future of that? It becomes a trade show. 
there comes a trade in. You uh, said it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, there is a, sometimes a feel about copying a trade show, and yeah. um, you know, you have a lot of a lot of organizations, NGOs. You have the country pavilions themselves mm. showing off their technology, That's showing right. off their ambition, uh, and there is sometimes a feel. I mean, Britain is very good at that. Yeah, the British pavilion is usually almost a trade a trade pavilion. It's like, look how great our products yeah. are, That's our low carbon products. So it's like, you know. I'm not sure they're necessarily following the brief all the time, but that's what we're getting in these days. I'm glad you mentioned Britain because I would actually put the UK as one of my losers this year. Mm. I find that last year with, with in Glasgow they've made um, progress. And they yeah, well they hosted they, it, yeah. They, I mean, it was their they, cup. they showed leadership. Yeah, they uh, got a result. They closed the Paris Agreement. Yeah, they, they, concrete. They, they, the, 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 the rule book was written. Um, and then what happened here? They, they, they descended into this madness of uh, you know the domestic crisis. They have. Uh, you know, Sunak decided he didn't want to come. He didn't want to come. And then he did come. And then he did come. Uh -huh. So I think that the, the distraction from the domestic economic outlook, the fact that they had, you know, three prime ministers in this yes. kind of just a few months, yep. um, really undermined their climate leadership. And they haven't decided, I think, exactly where they stand in these negotiations. Yep. Since the UK left, left the, the EU, EU yeah. they're no longer part of the you know, 28 country negotiating group, very powerful group in the, in the negotiating rooms. They have yet to really find their new place. Which group are they going to align themselves with? They've got a choice between the Environmental Integrity Group, which is led by Switzerland, yep. or the Umbrella Group, which includes Australia. Um, they, they could align themselves loosely with the EU group as well, but it would be the EU and UK, it wouldn't, mm. it wouldn't, it wouldn't be called that. So it's they're kind of in search of their new post, their post Brexit identity, even here in the climate talks. Do you have any other winner? I would say that another loser for me, and with my particular focus on carbon markets, has been the Article Six process. Uh -huh. uh, it's you know, it's bad. It's on, it's slow. It's bogged down in legal language. We've, we've talked about this before. Um, the problem is, if you give a UN negotiator a deadline, he's going to go right up to yeah. it. And um, some of the texts that came out of Glasgow last year said, we want this done by 2025, or this process has to the deadline of 2025. And that means you might as well just set your alarm clock for 2025 yeah. now, because nothing's going to happen. Um, you know, th there's no agreement until everything drops into place on the last day of COP, probably in 2025, which has been unfortunate for the countries, the developing countries, because they're looking to put these you know, deals in place projects in place and start generating uh, both you know f climate finance technology mm -hmm. transfer and selling carbon reductions to the developed to the developed world that's not going to happen in nearly enough volume uh, until those rules are actually nailed down and it's going to take a long time to do that some of the disagreements that I've been hearing about in the negotiating rooms are really very small small detail. yeah tiny details you yeah. know what what is an authorization of an emission reduction I mean what are you going to do with that? <laughs> I think that the fertilizer industry was a winner this year. So. I've seen panels with, you know, fertilizer company sitting next to some of the, the you know, policy makers from the EU and from the US. Mm -hmm. Those were panels that, that you would never see just last year, or even two okay. years ago, three years so ago. So industries are, are, are beginning to come in and make their, make their points here. Make their points here. And in, for this one, it's kind of like what you were saying about the fossil fuel industry. I think it's really because of the food crisis yeah, and this, 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 this uh, understanding that you, you, you kind of have to work with fertilizers to make a lot of, yeah, there's been a lot of talk about water as well. And water, Lots of talk about water, water. stress yeah, as well. Yeah. And I, I would put one more, one more winner in this market, uh, in, in this cup would be the voluntary carbon market. I haven't yeah. mentioned it before because yeah. at previous cops, it's been all about article six, the UN process. Yeah. Uh, and the, the voluntary carbon market, again, I just want to reiterate this point, has taken over this COP. The discussions, you know, usually at, at, at COPs, the discussion on carbon markets only really happened in one or two uh, delegations. The European Union, some of the climate uh, market NGOs, they would be where the discussion happened. This year, it's at most of the country Pavilions. pavilions, yeah. So Brazil has been hosting carbon That's market true. events. Um, you know, Indonesia, uh, Nigeria announced, yeah. announced the national carbon market just yesterday. Mm. You have a lot of announcements on carbon markets going on all around the place. That tells me the carbon market discussion is mainstream. And if it's not happening in a country near you, watch out, it soon will be. Yeah, I think that with that we can uh, we can wrap up our winners and yeah. losers conversation. That's a lot of them. Thank you all for following our COP27 updates. Cheers.